Hi, this is Dr. Amir Hossein Arzani, and in this series of lectures, I will be teaching advanced computational fluid dynamics using the finite element method. So the content of this class is based on a course that I had previously developed. So I'm going to go over the course content and talk about doing CFD modeling with the finite element method. So you can kind of think of this course as an advanced CFD and an advanced finite element class. So what's the course objective? The objective of this course is to learn how we can use finite element method for solving fluid flow equations. And the course will emphasize weak form derivatives, stabilized finite element methods, and practical considerations. Uh, and the goal of the class, the way this content for this course is uh, designed, is such that students will be able to use the open source finite element solver Phoenix much better with a better understanding of how the codes work by uh, going through this uh, theoretical lecture series. Um, so, uh, so hopefully if you've already, so it is actually very likely that if you've already taken a fine element class and you've already taken an uh, introductory CFT class, the content that you will see in this course are most likely going to be complementary and going to be adding up to the introductory fine element and introductory CFT courses that you've already had. The course also supports the tutorial series that I've created on GitHub called Pi for Sidecomp, Python for Scientific Computing, so in the, which you can check out using this link. And uh, I, I also provided the link in the description box. And uh, throughout this uh, Pi for Sidecomp uh, lecture uh, tutorial series, I have emphasized Phoenix and finite element modeling with Phoenix and writing codes in Phoenix. So these uh, a theoretical lecture series will hopefully uh, support those Phoenix tutorials. So now, what topics will we cover? So we will start by an overview of some basic mathematical preliminaries that we will be needing in this class. Then we will go over the finite element method. We will review the finite element method and how it works. And we'll mainly focus on the weak forms of the equations. Uh, and then we'll talk about Laplace and Poisson equations in multi-dimensions and deriving the weak form. We'll go over advection diffusion uh, mass transport equations with stabilized finite element. We'll talk about low Reynolds number flows and Stokes equation. And then we'll get it to incompressible Navier-Stokes formulation and finite element method using different class of fractional steps method and also coupled velocity pressure approaches. We'll talk about boundary conditions, uh, linear and nonlinear solvers, and also some practical implementation of CFD problems. So the references for this course, uh, the first two textbooks are textbooks that are, were mainly used for the content of this course, and these are the books that I uh, that I strongly uh, recommend. So uh, specifically the first textbook is uh, probably my favorite book uh, uh, published by Wiley called Find Element Methods for, Flu for Flow Problems. I will also provide a link to this book on the description box. Uh, there are also other textbooks that, uh, that could be used uh, for learning advanced CFT with find other methods. Specific, uh, probably the classical textbook in this area is Gresham's textbook, another one of my favorites, but it's a little bit uh, detailed and uh, maybe slightly harder book to follow compared to the uh, Donio Huerta textbook. Um, and then also, if you want to learn more about introductory fine online methods, so I recommend the book by Ready. It's a classic book in this in the introduction to fine element. And finally, fine element method is a math heavy uh, topic. It's uh, if you're interested in learning more about mathematical aspects of fine element, uh, these are two books that I recommend. They will not be necessary for uh, most engineers, but if you're interested and curious to learn more about how advanced mathematical concepts and theories are developed uh, within the fine element framework, you can uh, uh, check out these two great textbooks. Okay, so we can, we'll get started now. Uh, so I will first talk about, go over some mathematical definitions and preliminaries that we'll need. So uh, we will be dealing with functions and functionals in this class. Uh, 
And by a function, we mean essentially a mapping between two different vector spaces. So, so if u is belongs to Rn, v belongs to Rm, a mapping f that maps them, you can think of it as a function. A functional is a mapping between a function and a scalar value. So an integral of a function, which you integrate over some domain and gives you a single value at the end that you can think of as a functional. And an operator is a mapping between two function spaces. So it takes one function and generates another function that could possibly have other types of properties in terms of smoothness. For example, the derivative or function squared, these, you can think about the, this act of taking derivatives or uh, raising a function to power two as operators. So now uh, we will be dealing with inner products in this class. So when we talk about inner products, it's a mapping of this form uh, where you have two inputs uh, that belong to two um, spaces, it could be vector spaces or function spaces, and the output is a single scalar. We're going to be using this notation, a parenthesis, and inside the parenthesis denoting what the inner product's uh, acting on. So an inner product is essentially such an operation that satisfies these three properties. Uh, if you have a addition on the second argument, you can simply distribute it. If you have a scalar alpha multiplied, you can take it out. Uh, as long as these are real, uh, real uh, numbers, and also the inner product of a of a v with itself is always positive, and if the inner product is zero, v has to be equal to zero. So two great examples. One is inner products for vector fields. That's what we all know as dot products. So u dot v, uh, or u trans u transpose dot v. So that's the inner product between two vectors. And if u and v are functions, so functions of you know, for example, over a space, then uh, the the integral of these two functions multiplied by each other integrated over predefined space uh, omega is what uh, makes up the inner product. And when we say u and v are orthogonal, we imply that their inner product is zero. So then we can continue to define norms. A norm is a mapping pretty similar to inner product. It takes u from a space nu to R, but here you only have one, uh, you know, you don't have, you have two inputs, you only have one. And essentially a norm is a measure of how big a quantity is. So if you have a function, a vector field, you want to measure how big it is, a norm is a good way to go about doing that measure, that quantification. So a norm has to, uh, by definition, uh, uh, you know, it's defined to uh, satisfy these three properties. The first one is a triangle inequality. The second one, if you have a scalar multiplied by, for example, your vector or function, and you're calculating norm, you can take the scalar out and just you have to uh, add absolute value to it. And also norm is always positive. And if norm of V is zero, then V has to be equal to zero. So some examples of norm, the Euclidean norm, which you all know and have used is a one type of norm, which we typically know as the L2 norm. The infinity norm of a vector is maximum of its entry-wise maximum of the absolute values of its entries. And finally, if you if you have dealing with functions, you can calculate the norm, the Euclidean norm or the L2 norm by raising the function to power two and integrating over your domain and then taking the square root. So an, it's an application of norms in finite element is going to be when we want to talk about errors or do error estimates. So as an example, when you want to measure how exact our solution is, we can take the norm of the exact solution, if you know what the exact solution is, and we'll talk about this later in the course, minus the approximate finite element simula simulation result and take the L2 norm. So you can, this is how you can do it, uh, for example, if these are in function, form, this is how the equation is. And if not, you'll just use the, if they're vector form, which is how they probably are in finite element, uh, uh, then you will just use these types of, this type of. Okay, now the next thing we're gonna go over is uh, function spaces. So um, uh, we're gonna define some function spaces uh, the, that we're gonna be needing in this class. The first function space is an L2 function space. So when we talk about the L2, uh, so when we talk about function space, we have to define over what domain. So this omega is a domain of interest, which is where we're doing our mathematical operations. So we have to define, when we call it, talk about L2 space, for example, it's L2 and in parentheses omega, it, may, it, it implies that we're talking about this region of interest. So for L2 function, 
It's defined as the space of all functions that are square integrable, which means that if I take my function u, raise it to the power two, and integrate it over this predefined domain of interest omega, then this integral is bounded and it's not infinite. Okay, so that's L2, space of L2 functions. And, you know, we like these types of properties for functions because it allows us in finite element theory to do the mathematics and the calculus that we need to do, as you will see later. The other space that comes up frequently in finite elements is the so-called Sobolev space. It's a space of square integral functions, so the function already belongs to L2. However, we also require the function to be square integrable on its derivatives, and we can do that up to an order m. So when I write hm omega, it means that over this domain of interest omega, and not only my function is square integrable, so my function belongs to L2, but also all of its derivatives up to order m are also square integrable. So as an example, h1, u, it implies that u is, belongs to L2, and also du dx, so its derivative is also square integrable. So based on the Sobolev space, we can define the Sobolev inner product and norm. So the Sobolev inner product, which we denote with this uh, notation, is between two functions, u and v. It's pretty similar to the regular neural, uh, inner product we defined above, but with the addition of this new term, where now we also multiply the derivatives by each other. So not only just the functions u, but also their derivatives, and then we add it up. And then based on any inner product, we can always induce a norm. So the way we do that is that we replace v by u, so they're the same thing, and then we take the square root, and that gives us a norm. So in this case, the Sobolev norm is uh, the integral of u squared plus du dx squared, and then you take the square root. So the Sobolev norm is essentially extending the L2 norm to not only measure how big the function u is or its energy content, but also the amount of a derivative or the energy you have in your derivative, okay? Now, here's an example. So this is a function here that you're looking at. This function that you see here, this belongs to uh, L2 and also it's uh, H1, this function. If you take its derivative, you get this function, which is now discontinuous. So U prime is still L2. So this you can uh, still raise to the power to and integrate. So this function is L2. But if you take another derivative, U double prime, now you get the delta function, which you know it's not square integrable. The integral of delta function squared does not exist. So this no longer belongs to L2. Okay, uh, so now let's talk a little bit about gradient divergence and also integration by parts, which are other uh, mathematical preliminaries that we will be needing in this class. So the gradient, uh, so here we mean uh, spatial gradients are essentially partial partial x, y, and z acting on some input. For example, if the input u is a scalar, the gradient of a scalar is simply a vector vector given by partially partial x as the x entry, partially partial y, and partially partial z. You can think if u, your input u is a vector, the gradient of that gives you a tensor can think of it as a matrix. So the gradient operator always takes you one dimension higher. The gradient of a scalar is a vector. The gradient of a vector is a, a tensor. And now, and this is how the gradient of a vector looks like. Now for divergence, it's kind of like the opposite. It takes you a dimension down. If you have the divergence of a vector, which you can think about a dot product between gradient and the vector, then you get partial uh, ux partial x plus partial uy partial y plus partial uz partial z, which is a scalar. And if you have divergence of a tensor, that gives you a vector. vector. It takes you one dimension down. Now, the Laplacian is another operator that we'll need. Laplacian of a scalar is another scalar. And essentially, the Laplacian is defined as the divergence of gradient. So you can see that the gradient of a scalar gives you a vector. Divergence of a vector gives you a scalar. And this is what the Laplace is, essentially the second term. The next thing we need is integration by parts, which you're going to see frequently throughout this course. So if you use in the here v prime to denote d dx, dv dx, the partial derivative, if I have an integral of ux times v prime of x, 
Uh, what I can do, the motivation for integration by parts is that I want to take the derivative from one term and give it to the other term. So in this case, V prime, I don't want V to have derivatives. So I take the derivative that's acting on V. I throw it at all the other terms that are here, in this case, U of X. And by doing that, I change the sign. So I have the same integral. The derivative is gone from V to the other terms, so U and the sign changes. And also when you take the derivative, whatever you're left, so in this case, u times v, you have to write it down as a boundary term. So in this case, it's a 1D integral. So the boundary term is simply this evaluated at the end of, at b, at the end of integration minus evaluated at a. Okay, so that's the, the integration of parts. Uh, and you can also do this at higher dimensions. So if I have a domain omega with boundary gamma, I have a normal, to the boundary unit normal vector on boundary uh, denoted with n. If I have integrals like this, for example, v times Laplacian of u, I mean, infinite element, we will deal with these types of integrals uh, quite a bit. And what we, the motivation there is that we want to get uh, away with doing calculus on second derivatives for reasons that we'll see later. So we want to take the, the second derivative from u and give it to v, so kind of like, uh, make all the derivatives first order. So by doing that, I take the derivative from Laplace and of u, I give it to v. So the order of the derivative of u goes down, it becomes grad u, the v now has gradient on it, and then the sign changes, becomes minus. And also, I also have a boundary term. And as I said, the boundary term, you take the derivative from Laplace and of u or whatever term you want. So you have grad u, and then you leave grad u with v, Okay, with the same sign, but now in this case, since it's a 2D integral, we also have to first do the dot product with the normal vector, and then we can integrate over the bound. So this grad u dot n, you can also think of it as partial u partial n, where n is a normal vector on the boundary, and this is a boundary integral. Okay, so um, then uh, the next thing that we'll uh, uh, need is pro the product rule for divergence. So if, if I have the divergence of a scalar multiplied by a vector, I can apply the product rule as such. So first, the scalar times the divergence of the vector plus divergence of the gradient of a scalar. So now whenever you deal with these types of uh, divergence, gradient, vector, tensor quantities, it's very good exercise to look at every term, determine if that's a vector, tensor, or scalar, and convince yourself about the consistency of the equations. So now, for example, in this case, rho is a scalar, v is a vector. So this is a vector. Divergence of a vector is a scalar. So I'm dealing with a scalar equation. So the other terms better be also scalar. So the divergence of v, the divergence of a vector is a scalar, multiplied by a scalar, that's a scalar. And then gradient of a scalar brings me up, so that's a vector. And I have dot product between two vectors here, so that's a scalar. And actually, if you think of it this way, then you can, whenever you're doing these product rules, so you have tensors, vectors, whatever, you uh, it will be easier you know, without memorizing actually to write down the correct form of how these multiplications should be written. Okay, so finally we have the divergence theorem, the divergence of a vector field F, or it could be a tensor field as well, integrated over some volume is the same as the flux of that quantity F over integrated over the boundary. So essentially you take the gra gradient and you replace it by the normal vector on the boundary. So divergence of F becomes the dot product of F with the normal vector. Uh, and then um, that's integrated over the bound. So essentially what this equation tells you is that divergence is somehow telling you something about conservation of quantities because when you, if you integrate divergence of a quantity over an entire volumetric region, that's the same as the flux of that quantity that's you know, entering or exiting the boundaries of the domain. 